You know, my research interest stems, I think, over the last 20 years. Um, Western Michigan University is kind of my third institution uh, where I was a professor. Um, and so I came here directing the doctoral program in counselor education, counseling psychology. So my research at that time was definitely moving into looking at preparing people for the professoriate, uh, particularly um, African American uh, students in particular that were interested in becoming professors in counselor education, but definitely all students in general uh, that were interested in being professors in counselor ed. So most of my work during that time was, you know, how do we get students to publish? How do we train them to become researchers and doing the type of research that's going to impact society? But my beginning research was on child discipline, and that's really what I focus on right now. Um, because I entered the field of counseling um, at wanting to help people. Um, because I, and I wanted to help uh, clients that may not have had access to mental health care. So um, I obtained my master's in social agency counseling um, at the University of Dayton and then um, started counseling, became a licensed professional counselor, again, almost 20 years ago. And as I was counseling, I realized that there were a lot of things going on that there weren't really answers to, particularly um, different types of treatment techniques for uh, families, uh, different type of treatment techniques for individuals, particularly African Americans, that I thought uh, were culturally responsive. One of those areas was the area of parenting. Um, I was also a child welfare worker for a short period of time and ran into a lot of issues where I disagreed with whether or not a parent was actually engaging in child abuse. I thought they were effective forms of child discipline, but the agency thought otherwise. And I saw parents going through, I felt, unnecessary parenting requirements and also being subjected sometimes to criminal charges because they, want, they were just disciplining their children. So that was an area of research that I had coming into the field after my doctorate. I put it down because it wasn't the most popular thing that, that was, I felt was going to get me through the promotion and tenure process. Um, it was hard getting articles published because editors uh, cringed when they saw the term whoopings or when they saw the term spanking and then wanted me to write about how bad spanking was as opposed to really what my research found and to highlight, highlight those findings. So I'm here today, I think, not here today, but uh, at this point, I think, in my career, in the 20th year, I think, of my career, in the last five years or so, really um, taking the next step in terms of how can I try to impact policy and trying to change where some of the research findings that I have found, how can I change how agencies view families that parent from a comprehensive perspective, a holistic perspective? How do I change, and particularly the mental health profession, and how we're assisting families with uh, the socialization of their children? Creating new paradigms of thought, um, or really doing a paradigm shift Whereas if we say that we're operating from the developmental model, um, that we're not thinking of one type of family in particular, you know, kind of the mainstream way of doing things as opposed to we are part of a global society. And there are multiple ways that I think we can approach parenting and the raising of children in our society. One of my biggest struggles um, in the discipline of um, psychology and mental health um, is that for many years we informed families and society on what is the best way to parent a child. Um, those have happened, I mean, the techniques that we've come up with over the last, I would think, 40 or 50 years um, was that there was a thought that um, there was one way of doing it, and that is whatever you do, don't spank a child. Whatever you do, don't yell at a child. Whatever you do um, should be more of a democratic way, give and take response between the parent and the child. Um, but however, some of the techniques that we were advocating that were good for parents um, weren't always uh, research-based, and then some of the findings were inconclusive. I guess what I'm saying is that um, when we actually research 
a diverse group of families, we get a diverse group of responses. Most of our research, probably in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, we looked at white American middle class families and whatever we found as being good approaches, meaning that children behavior changed, or negative approaches where children might have been hurt somewhere emotionally or physically in the process, was, was the base and the standard of what is appropriate parenting or appropriate child rearing. But then we used that same standard with all families. We compared African American families to this white American middle class approach. We compared Latino families. We compared Native Americans. And yes, we also compared Asian American families to that. So what happens is if you did not parent in that way, then you were deemed as, as being either abusive, strict, or problematic, and your behavior or your parenting behaviors had to change. Um, so part of this issue where we are in now where um, it's hard to accept sometimes or embrace diversity in parenting is that um, in the field of study and research, we did a lot of comparison studies. The other thing that we have to acknowledge is that the same types of struggles with diversity and racism that we had overall in our society um, from right after slavery into the Industrial Revolution, um, pre-civil rights, during the civil rights, it did not um, stop at the, uh, the door before it came into psycho psychology. Um, we were very much in the thick of that as well, so a lot of our thoughts even about these groups were not um, um, were very problematic, thinking that just because a parent was African American, they were already going to be fraught with problems or deemed as at risk. Um, so that also cloaks the way parenting discussions are being held today. Pu public policies are often set up um, with looking at African American pa parents and focusing on low income parents as a, a norm of understanding the dynamics in African American families. Mental health is the same way. Uh, most, a lot of mental health techniques that we have now in treatment plans um, kind of backdoor in, meaning that we set up cognitive behavioral approaches, but then we may say, okay, this is how you adapt the approach to work with Latino or African American clients, as opposed to coming up with approaches that have African American or Latino clients at the center, at the ground floor of understanding what to do in treatment, as opposed to an adaption of a treatment model. If I had to think of what were some of my main important points um, in this focus on child discipline, um, in general and child discipline with African American families in particular, is that African American families are use diverse techniques like all families do. Um, it, that's the one thing that I wanted to, um, or I thought as a researcher was going on, but then I had to test it out. So most of my research at the beginning was asking the how and the what questions. Okay. What types of techniques do you use with your children to address inappropriate behavior? You know, how do you carry this out? What type of parenting goals do you have for your children? Um, so I found we use diverse uh, techniques. There's also child discipline on a continuum where we start with the least restrictive techniques, such as discussion with the child, and then it may progress to withdrawal of privileges. And at times, if the child's behavior is very inappropriate and disrespectful, um, and it's not falling through with the rules and demands of the culture and the family, then parents may use physical discipline with children, usually when they're under the age of 11 or so. Um, those are the major takeaways. But the biggest one is um, to, to kind of dispel this notion that parenting while black means problems. And I think, you know, just as we see in our society about driving while black, you know, creates uh, problems because it's the profiling aspect that once we see an African-American driver on the highway, police and others may think there's something that's going on or that it, they're problematic. Where the same thing is the minute we see a parenting situation and the parent is African-American, we don't automatically assume a child's in danger or that there's something that we have to go in and investigate or that we have to automatically surveillance or put African-American families on surveillance. Research shows right now today that, in, even in the state of Michigan, that African-American parents have a higher chance of just being investigated by Child Protective Services, and that's 
all income levels than white American parents. And this is in 2014, I think, was the last research. So we're still struggling with that today. So moving into the public policy and changing the mindset of this parenting while black, I think is probably the biggest takeaway that my research um, findings have helped to, to have that discussion. And my continued research will hope to just do a complete paradigm shift that we can think of all families of in respecting the integrity of the family, wanting and knowing that parents and children want to stay together and finding ways to support them from their standpoint, not our own. Collaboration uh, is, is a good thing, I think, when you're a researcher because sometimes you don't have all the answers and you got to figure out where uh, your strong point is, and also where you want to place your concentration. Uh, the best thing I think we do as professors in the field of, in, in, of doctoral study is to train doctoral stu students to do the entire research process, you know, to come up with a statement of a problem, to, you know, survey the research to make sure that, you know, a study has not done, been done exactly like that before, or if so, how will you extend that study? There is the analysis of the data. There is the interpretation of the data. There are recommendations that we make with the data. And so we train students to make sure that they can do research from soup to nuts, right? But the thing that's most important as they graduate and actually start applying research is there's going to come a time like I, I realized about five years ago that um, to make an impact and to translate for society, for government, for education, for public policy, that how do I translate what the findings mean and put them into practical terms so that we can have change? That's when I knew I needed to bring on a team of people to work with. I brought on um, Dr. Jeffrey Terpstra, um, who his primary focus was developing formulas that was specific, or statistical formulas and, and applications that was specific for the type of population that I was studying. Sometimes the, the numbers of African American families I was studying was small, so we had to develop unique ways to look at differences. Um, I also brought in um, a child, um, a um, trial attorney, um, attorney Dorphine Payne. Um, because you needed the legal aspect of this as I kept talking about uh, differences between child discipline and child abuse and someone who was front and center in the courtroom advocating for families to retain their children and understanding the notion of law and policy. Um, by adding those to the team, that gave me a kind of a, a, an anchor of being able to have this conversation with the world about what's going on. I mean, I understand the phenomenon as a researcher in child discipline of, of asking parents uh, questions and getting parents to respond to me, understanding their mental health concerns. But when I have everyone at the table, we're able to go to law conferences, we're able to go to uh, conferences with the American Counseling Association. We're also able to talk with child welfare agencies and be able to have the same message in each domain, but cater to their needs and wants and issues and concerns. So I think collaboration and in interdisciplinary research is the, the future. Um, because we have to be able to, if we're gonna talk about diversity, then why can't the research team be diverse, not just, and it's important to have it diverse in terms of, of race and ethnicity, but also thought and viewpoint, and also the various societies that you may have to touch and approach. One of the things that I do um, in teaching students um, is getting them to apply what they're learning in the classroom and to be able to think about how they're gonna impact society in some type of way. Uh, when I talk with people that are interested in a master's program, say in mental health, or in psychology or counseling, or they're interested in a PhD program in any discipline and want to be a researcher, uh, particularly in the area of doctoral level is first, uh, first think about what are the reasons why you want to get a doctorate degree. Sometimes people just like the title. They like being called I'm Dr. So-and-so or they like having a PhD behind their name. Um, well, we have a lot of doctorates, you know, 
in these days. And you can get them pretty much kind of easy sometimes on, on the internet, pay for them yourself, you know, and the like. But I try to get them to start thinking is, what type of contribution do you want to make to society? And is, it, is the PhD a requirement for that? So that means that if you want to impact change in a certain type of way, if you want to try to um, change policy, if you want to try to develop new ways and techniques in, in the area of mental health, then yes, the PhD takes you that additional step. Being a clinician is wonderful, and at the master's level, you can pretty much be a licensed mental health counselor, a licensed school counselor. But if you want to start training people at the graduate level, you, a, a doctorate is required. A doctorate is required to teach at major universities to engage in research so that you can position yourself to be able to contribute society. Now, even in making that decision to um, engage in research, the understanding what it takes. And it's more than just doing the work. It's constantly being open to feedback. It's constantly reading and wanting to know more than what's required because the stakes are higher. You know, when you go before um, a, a, a law conference and your discipline's mental health and, and you're presenting your research and you feel, oh, I think this is good for attorneys too, attorneys are going to ask attorney questions and you're a mental health person. So that means it's required of you to understand things globally. So how, if you want to be, to study um, depression, um, not only wanting to study it on in the area of how psychology would understand it, but studying depression on how your own mother would understand it, your neighbor would understand it, and thinking of always having them in your mind on why you decided to move forward and also the different ways that our um, disciplines can meet the needs of not only you, your family, but the society at large.